Thank you so much for coming today on a Saturday to join us for such a special occasion. Before we start our conversation, I want to take my privilege as the chair to introduce our distinguished speaker who are here with us. Uh, Sabir Chaudhry, Member of Parliament, is a Bangladeshi politician and a Member of Parliament from Dhaka, holding office since 2008. He was the youngest member of the cabinet, serving as the deputy minister at the Ministry for Port and Shaping, and later at the local government, rural development, cooperatives between 1999 and 2001. Sabir was the 28th president of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, IPU, for three years since 2014, and is awarded an honorary president upon completion of his term. More importantly, he's the chair of the Parliamentary Standing Committee of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. For his leadership in promoting parliamentary relations, he's been recognized with the highest state awards, all just a friendship from Russian Federation and Vietnam. Also, we're joined by Nahim Razik, Member of Parliament, who is a Bangladeshi politician, is an elected Member of Parliament for three consecutive terms for one of the most climate vulnerable district in Bangladesh. He's currently the convener of Climate Parliament Bangladesh. Thank you so much for joining us today. I guess a question on everyone's mind who is in the member of the audience today is with COP26 has just closing, has COP26 failed climate vulnerable countries? I guess I first look to Sabir. For, for, for his answer. Thank you, and um, thanks for this opportunity. I think it's, it's wonderful to be here with you this evening. And you were thanking us for making time, but you know, when I look at the audience, so many of them have made their times over the weekend, so we are deeply appreciative, and uh, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, in terms of, of COP, you know, this is uh, the 26th COP that we have had. COP, by the way, stands for Conference of Parties. Uh, there was an agreement signed in 1992 where uh, all of the countries of the world uh, signed a treaty. And the basic objective was how can we stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and limit it to a level that is going to prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. So that was the whole idea of COP. And the fact that we have had 26, or we will be, because this COP is still in motion as we speak, um, indicates that the progress hasn't really been what we would like it to be. Because during this period, uh, temperatures have continued to rise. Uh, so when we went into the current COP in Glasgow, and this is taking place after two years, because of COVID it couldn't take place last year. So the expectations were very high. And the fact that the US is, is back, as per Mr. Biden, we are back in business. Um, we wanted to see some reflection of that. So it wasn't just a normal COP. Um, it was actually quite unique in terms of the context. Uh, so it was on the one hand uh, an acid test for multilateralism. You know, can the countries of the world come together and deliver what, the, uh, what science is desperately telling us or pleading with us? And uh, of course, over the last two years, we have seen the impacts of climate change. It hasn't just been limited to the climate vulnerable countries of Bangladesh, it's the world over. So when we are going to judge this COP, it is not going to be in context of what it has done for the climate vulnerable countries. I think the bigger picture is, what has it done for the world? What has it done for the planet? Because at the end of the day, each country is vulnerable. So if the COP fails to deliver, uh, it's not the climate vulnerable countries that are going to be impacted. I think the whole world is going to be impacted. And uh, so there were some, some red lines you know, that we talked about that we have to achieve this. And the first and foremost was limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, because that is considered to be uh, a level which is going to avoid the worst impacts. Although at 1.1, we know what the impacts are. See, currently, the planet has warmed 1.1 degrees. So 1.5 is not a perfect solution. It's not a comfort zone, but it is the best that we can think of. So there, uh, the requirement from science, and this is not Bangladesh or the climate vulnerable countries saying, science is actually telling us that we have to uh, cut our emissions by 45% by the year 2030, and by 2050, we have to be net zero. So, you know, the 2030 um, benchmark is very important because if you can't reach the target in 2030, you're never going to make it in 2050. 
So there, what we are now looking at, based on best pledges, is a rise of 2.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, basically, just to give you some perspective and without making it too technical, um, the uh, wisdom from science is if you exceed two degrees Celsius, then all the coral leaves of the world are going to die. So that's where we are at. So it's an ecosystem issue. It is a survival issue, and Bangladesh refers to it as an existential crisis. So there we are not doing too well. You know? And uh, the, the main source of emissions, what we refer to as dirty energy, is coal. Uh, for the first time in the COP uh, conferences, coal is actually referred to in the, in the declaration. But then it was watered down. So, uh, and this is, I suppose, the frustrating part of UNFCCC, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Control, because it has to be on the base of consensus. So literally every word, every sentence, where you will have a full stop, where you will have a comma, has to be agreed by 195 countries. Mm -hmm. So it's a basis of consensus that drives the process. And you can imagine 195 countries, uh, where will you have the consensus? So unfortunately, it's not looking too good. You know, there is some progress, but nowhere near where we need to be or science wants us to be. And I think this is where we start asking, is the UN uh, system, or particularly with regard to climate change, to what extent is it fit for purpose? If it doesn't deliver the results we want it to deliver, if uh, because of consensus, which of course is the essence of multilateralism, mm -hmm. you know, uh, without consensus you don't move forward. But when countries or parties abuse that system, mm -hmm. um, then it doesn't work. And, and what happens now in reality, which I've also seen in this COP, and I'm talking in absolute candor, by the way, because I'm sure you have come here to, to actually, um, I'm not trying to window dress anything, I'm trying to give it to you as it is. So what really happens now is because it's consensus, so you have what we refer to as the lowest common denominator. So nothing is agreed till everyone agrees. Nothing is agreed till every item is agreed. So that means you find the lowest threshold mm -hmm. to get consensus. But at a time when we know that the world is in an emergency mode, you know, we have declared a planetary emergency, the House of Commons in the UK has declared a climate emergency. You need to have action that is bold. You need to have action that is aspirational, decisive. But that is not going to happen with this consensus system. So I think, you know, we are, we are stuck in that because even uh, Mr. Alok Sharma, uh, the UK president of COP, he repeatedly talked about the need and the imperative of ambition. And then he's saying, but we have to have consensus. So really the question is, can consensus-based politics or the way the UN system works, is it going to be appropriate for us to get results on climate change? So far, my experience is it's not. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for a very candid opening remark. I guess we'll come back a lot to the bigger players in the international system, whether this consensus-based policymaking uh, is suited to tackle the challenge we're facing. Uh, now I wanted to move to Nahim. As the convener of climate um, parliament, Bangladesh, do you think, how do you think this COP has went this year? Well, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to be here. I think it's a privilege to be here. And of course, uh, the way, of course, my uh, esteemed colleague has uh, given his opening remark, it sets the tone for the next one hour session. And that's very important to know what are the grounds that we are actually working towards. Uh, for me, of course, you know, I, I work with the young people. So hence, uh, the young and the bold, they want to see some affirmative action. And that is uh, driven through their uh, thought process and of course we are talking about the future of the world and the future of the young people going forward and that's very important uh, from a national point of view of course you know we are doing as much as we are doing in our own capacity Bangladesh has leapfrogged in terms of taking uh, adequate measures in terms of tackling climate change although it's affecting millions and millions of lives uh, we are seeing the number of super cyclones going across Bangladesh. You know, it's, it's increased, you know, many folds. And not only so, but also there is um, 
climate migrants, which we have to tackle domestically. So that's, that's a challenge that we have to adopt domestically. Uh, but then again, from a global point of view, my context is that, you know, of course, uh, uh, multilateralism is being challenged. And we have seen this challenge over the few couple of years, uh, especially since uh, Paris Agreement, um, which actually set the tone for aggressive uh, negotiation to, uh, to tackle climate change, we haven't had much progress. And as uh, been mentioned by Mr. Sabaros and Chaudhry, that this COP was something that we were all looking for, forward to. Uh, the last uh, COP that was supposed to be held in Peru, which eventually got transferred, uh, shifted to Madrid, which really did not have enough impact. Um, and as such, this COP uh, had a lot of aspiration, a lot of uh, uh, demands from everyone, but unfortunately consensus is something which is, to, which is hard to come by. Um, we do not want to see uh, a failure in terms of multilateralism because multilateralism is a way forward for the world to speak in one word, one voice, and have consensus across the board to create an ecosystem where our futures are, are being uh, basically secured. So this is a very important statement that we, the youth, actually think. And hence, uh, the COP today, uh, of course, I think tomorrow we will get to hear what the final draft is coming off to. Uh, but then again, as the convener of uh, climate parliament in Bangladesh, you know, what we are trying to do, we, we are trying to uh, work towards uh, uh, achieving the national uh, targets that, we, that has been set. We are on course, but then again, there are huge challenges going forward, and that's where the global community needs to come forward. Because Bangladesh is really, as been mentioned by Sajid, that you know, Bangladesh is emitting uh, less than 1% of the global emission, but we are affected heavily. And of, of course, it's a delta. We, we, have to be, uh, we have to look into the geographical location, it's not about the climate vulnerable countries, but rather what is affecting the people on the ground. And that's where uh, we have to make uh, demanding and aggressive moves to tackle. As such, I just want to give a, a slight note on it. Bangladesh, uh, and has been mentioned by Mr. Sabaros and Chaudhry, in the utilization of coal as a primary fossil fuel, mm -hmm. it, this is something that Bangladesh has taken up uh, very aggressively. We have uh, shut down, uh, we have closed, uh, or we have terminated, uh, uh, I think it's about five uh, coal power plants. Ten. Ten. Uh, which would have uh, gotten about almost four to six billion US dollar investments, I think. That's something, it's a statement. And especially coming to COP, we have made a statement. So as a vulnerable country, when we can act, of course, surely the developing countries, they can act so. And of course, we want to come back also into the discussion and I would welcome uh, a lot of questions from the audience as well, that what COVID has done to us, whether COVID has affected the aspiration that we had for COP26. That's also something uh, that is of context. So we need to think about that part of it as well. Mm -hmm. It's very good you mentioned the global pandemic. I think I want to pick up on this and put out a broader question to both of you, to invite both of you to contribute. Um, has COVID distracted our attention to tackle climate change, climate change challenge, or has it helped us, as the crisis does, to help us focus our mind to think about solutions we have? On the globally world or in the context of Bangladesh? Uh, globally and in the context of Bangladesh. I think globally, you know, everyone was caught off guard. Uh, whether you are a very developed economy with a very advanced and mature health system, uh, or whether you are a country like Bangladesh where it's still evolving. So everyone was caught out. Everyone was taken by surprise by the, by the speed and by the intensity of, of COVID. So I think initially everyone's mind was focused on COVID. And then when you started to look at the recovery phase, you know, the whole issue of green recovery came in. Um, one of the terms that you will probably hear quite often nowadays is build back better. Mm -hmm. You know, that's actually a term that uh, originated from the Sendai framework um, of uh, disaster management. So it was, it meant building back better in physical infrastructure terms. Mm -hmm. But then I think uh, with COVID, it's now being applied uh, from a conceptual point of view that you throw everything up in the air, you see how it falls down 
and then you try and, and uh, build back better. So the green recovery was also a response to the environmental crisis that we were having. So I think that provided an opportunity to both recover from COVID and build back better at the same time. Uh, so we green our economies, we decarbonize our economies. And one of the things that we did, and um, along with my colleague here today, is uh, we had a motion in our parliament on a planetary emergency, because we, we tried to look at the crisis from a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just climate. So if you look at uh, disasters, disasters are happening more often, so the frequency has gone up, and the impact, the intensity, the devastation is a lot higher. Uh, you look at water stress. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can envisage a map of South Asia and you have Bangladesh with the Bay of Bengal to the south, and to the north of that, you have the Himalayas. Now, the Himalayas are the water towers for South Asia. You have approximately seven, 800 billion people who rely on their uh, supply of fresh water from the Himalayas. Now, what's happening there? Because of a, a warming climate, the glaciers have started to melt as they have all over, you know, in the Arctic, you see this. So those uh, waters are now draining through Bangladesh, causing flooding into the Bay of Bengal. And then you also have sea level rise. So for us, uh, it's a whole package, you know, so water stress, uh, the availability of water is a major issue. For us, food security is a major issue because with uh, rising sea levels, you're going to lose land that you use for cultivation and agriculture. And of course, globally, the whole issue of planetary overshoot, um, that is, you know, how much resources do we have available in any given calendar year to spend? So you should space out your resources so that you can use them for the entire 12 months. But the rate at which we are using our natural resources means that you are out by the time you are in um, July or August. Mm -hmm. So our planetary overshoot day for the Earth is now actually 1st of August. So we need two planet Earths to sustain our, our resources. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, we needed to have a reset. Mm -hmm. We needed to have a course correction. And COVID gave us that opportunity, although it's not an opportunity that we are looking for. You know, if you look at the number of deaths that have taken place all over the world, and I know it's not a numbers game, it's not statistics, because even one death is one too many. Uh, so that gave us an opportunity to look at the way we uh, structure our economies. Mm -hmm. And in the planetary motion resolution of Bangladesh parliament, we talked about decarbonizing our economies. Mm -hmm. So what my colleague talked about, you know, for a country like Bangladesh to walk away from $12 billion, that takes a lot of political courage. You know, when countries are crying out for foreign direct investment because the 10 coal power plant contracts that we have canceled actually would have brought in $12 billion for Bangladesh. And remember that to a country that has suffered losses of $11 billion last year on account of natural disasters. So I think uh, the point is, is very well made because this is exactly what we are asking the developed world to do. Uh, we are asking them basically to keep their pledges. I mean, Bangladesh is not asking for any favors. The climate vulnerable countries are not asking for any flavor, uh, favors. We are telling the developed world that keep the promises mm -hmm. that you have made, honor your pledges. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just for us because, you know, today I, I have this batch of climate vulnerable countries. Mm -hmm. But at the more, in a question of a few years, all the countries of the world are going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it is floods, whether it's droughts, whether it's uh, cyclones. So vulnerability, it's not a question of if for the developed world. It is a question of when. So it's going to come. And um, if you imagine a typical scene of Bangladesh, you know, when I think of Bangladesh, I see a river. I see lots of boats on that river. So imagine that those boats are countries. And one of the boats is Bangladesh. So if the boat of Bangladesh sinks, all of the boats on that river are also going to sink. You know, so all of the countries will have the same fate. And this is what we simply can't get across to the developed world or some of the leaders. You know, they, they talk a lot, they say nice words, noble sentiments, you know, we have to be aspirational, we have to fix this. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't translate to the negotiators on the table. We just don't see it, there's a huge uh, disconnect. And uh, so unless leaders act like leaders, unless leaders follow through on their pledges, 
-hmm. You know, we are going to have probably 100 cops if the world is still around then, and nothing will change. So I think that is, that is very, very important, you know, that we, we act. And, and remember, it's not just acting, it's acting now. Mm -hmm. The speed of action is important. Because if you don't act now, then the window of opportunity that exists is going to close. And whatever you do tomorrow is going to be too little too late. So that message really has to go through. Now, I know, you know, governments work in cycles of four years or five years. Mm -hmm. And they can't think about, you know, what is going to happen in year six. So they do what is most expedient for their period. How can they get more votes? Mm -hmm. How can they be more popular? but they are not looking at what is staring them in the face in 10 or 15 years. And this disconnect between government cycles or election cycles mm -hmm. and the, the nature of the problem, I think is another challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, before I move on to Nahim, I just want to pick up on something you said specifically about climate change related flooding and the loss and damages. I know one of the priority on the agenda for Bangladesh to this year's conference is loss and damage, which is included in the draft. Uh, but the draft actually stopped short in setting up a fund to compensate climate-related loss and damages. Um, but over the summer, we have actually seen extreme climate changes, weather related to flooding in Europe, in Germany, which are developing countries, and they are starting to get a taste of what those things are, which has started in climate vulnerable countries a long time ago. As one of the key negotiators on behalf of Bangladesh, are you happy with the progress being made and what kind of outcome on loss and damages are we expecting? You want to say? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I was actually involved in the negotiation on the Santiago um, uh, Accord and the network. Mm -hmm. So what we have this year is there is some progress in terms of we have tried to define the functions. Mm -hmm. So what is it that the uh, loss and damage uh, scenario is going to look like? Um, and I'll be again brutally frank. The reason why the developed world doesn't like loss and damage is because it involves two other words. One is liability, the other is compensation. So every time they see loss and damage, you know, they say, oh my God, I have to pay compensation. You know, I, I'm accepting and admitting liability. But we have kept it in the text. You know, it is in the text. No fund has been set up. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least the issue is alive. You know, it has not been thrown out. And loss and damage, uh, basically, I know we are using a lot of technical terms. I don't know, you know, how much you have read into it. So when we first started the UNFCCC process in 1992, the first thing we looked at was mitigation, which is reducing our emissions, OK? So then in the early 2000, we realized that uh, mitigation is not being controlled and it is causing harm. Then we started looking at adaptation. Mm -hmm. Now we are at the third phase where we know both mitigation and adaptation have failed. So like he talked about the climate migrants. So imagine a person in a, in a coastal area of Bangladesh where his ancestors have lived for hundreds, thousands of years where his uh, great, great grandparents are buried, the attachment that he has to those lands, and he's displaced, okay? So he has to move to Dhaka, he has to move to Chiragong, he has to move to one of the cities. So that is a loss that you cannot recover. It's not a bridge, a bridge can get washed away and you can build another bridge. So when you have loss which is beyond adaptation, when you have loss when mitigation has failed, that is loss and damage, which is the third dimension. And I think a lot of developing countries are looking at that. I was talking um, to the speaker uh, from Tuvalu. Uh, you know, he was there. Uh, also from Kiribati, they were there. And they are saying that, look, our lands are going to drown. Uh, so what is, so that is loss and damage because the land which has been wiped off or it is submerged totally doesn't exist. You know, the, you also have issues, uh, some of you may wish to research that. Then do they remain a country? Uh, what happens to the Maldives if it is completely submerged because there is no part which is sticking out of the water. So then the Maldives uh, fails to exist as a country. Tuvalu fails to exist as a country. Marshall Islands fail to exist as a country. You know, so this is also another interesting question uh, that what happens to that country. So there has been some progress, uh, but not to the extent that we would like. You know, the loss and damage is important. And the other, of course, you see, before loss and adaptation, 
uh, the pledge in Paris in 2015 mm -hmm. was $100 billion was going to be set, set aside for adaptation. Mm -hmm. 50 billion for mitigation, reducing emissions, and 50 billion for adaptation. Mm -hmm. Now you look at what is the delivery? The delivery is probably around 70 billion. Mm -hmm. So even in six years, we have not been able to honor our commitment. And you know, a really interesting thing, we still don't have an agreed definition of climate finance. So what we found that a lot of the countries who have Overseas Development Assistance, ODA, they are packaging that as climate finance, which is not right. You know, climate finance has to be new and additional. Mm -hmm. And so far, we couldn't even agree on a definition. So uh, in one of the negotiations that I was in, we pushed very hard. And I'm hopeful that in the next COP, which is going to be in Egypt, mm -hmm. in uh, the COP27, we will actually have a definition for climate finance. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to the COP presidency, Mr. Alok Sharma, unless we have a definition, these references to millions, uh, trillions, and billions don't make any sense mm -hmm. because uh, it doesn't translate to actual money that you're getting. So all of these uh, loopholes you know, have been there in the system, and we are still negotiating. So that's, I think, where the frustration comes in. Um, he's absolutely right, my colleague. I mean, Bangladesh is a firm believer in multilateralism. Look at our contribution to the UN system. Look at what, you're, you know, what we are doing with, uh, with the peacekeeping. And you know, Bangladesh has the largest contingent of military and police and other uh, peacekeepers. But when people try to use the, the spirit of multilateralism, which is consensus, because consensus reinforces trust. Consensus builds ambition. But if it is used the wrong way, mm -hmm. that I'm going to hide behind a technicality of a word so that we don't have agreement, mm -hmm. then you're actually frustrating mm -hmm. multilateralism, mm -hmm. which is why I asked the question, are we doing this just to keep the process going? Just to tell the whole world, oh yes, we have a process and we are discussing and negotiating, or are we going to solve the problems of the day? And so far, we have not been able to do that. And I think we have to call that out for what it is. That's really, really insightful. Thank you. Um, going back to Nahim, we started on this uh, COVID question. How has that impacted our effort to tackle climate change? Maybe you can share with us, especially from a national perspective, from Bangladesh. Right. I think um, it's, it's a difficult scenario for Bangladesh when we're talking about the national aspect of it. Um, of course, as my colleague, esteemed uh, colleague, has already mentioned, it's caught all of us. It doesn't matter whether it's a developed country, underdeveloped country, or whatever. So everyone has been affected, no doubt. Uh, but it's, it's how we handle uh, the situation. And of course, uh, I'm proud to say that Bangladesh, although with our limited resources, we have had significant positive impact in tackling the COVID situation. When we connect uh, COVID and climate change, how does that uh, relate? And that's, that's a very interesting way to actually look into it because when we're talking, since this session is all about climate change and the impacts of climate change, it is important that you understand uh, how that is connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Of course, Bangladesh uh, is developing into a, 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 a developing country we have you know, come out of uh, LDC, and of course, we are aspiring to be a developing country. Uh, but then again, we have to look into how the progression has happened in the last uh, 12 years, especially considering since 2008, when a democratic government has all again come back to power. So since 2008, we have had significant growth trajectories. And that, in turn, is changing the lives of uh, every people across Bangladesh. Now, again, I want to challenge uh, the audience here as to what the narrative should be like. What is the narrative of development? Does the narrative of development mean saving lives? Or is it uh, the narrative of development should be industrialization? Or is it uh, monetization? What is the narrative of uh, development? The developed country is, of course, uh, uh, they are working uh, to be a developed 
country and with the riches that they have, they have to uh, put their, where their mouth is, they need to put their money where that is. So again, we are tackling in our own, own way. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has been very aggressive in terms of tackling the COVID. Uh, not only so, but of course, she has challenged the institutions to deliver. And there again, the, the critical word is deliver. So whether we are actually doing enough, we are contributing enough. So hence, you know, we are talking about in the region, uh, let's say uh, in the last uh, 12 years, uh, the, the percentage of the population who were uh, uh, under uh, the, um, I would say, low income group, that has been uh, brought in down. I think it was 42% and then we brought it down to 21% something on, on the region. Then again, this COVID has given rise to new uh, numbers of uh, people who are uh, on the low income uh, population. So this is a challenge for us. So we are, we are recovering in our own way, let's see. You know, in the, the progress that has been made, the COVID has brought us again, we have, has put us into a back foot. But then again, you know, we are, tackling in our own capacity. It's just a global community that has to you know, put where the, their mouth is and do what that needs to be done. And that's the major statements uh, we are expecting, especially tomorrow, I think you know, we can uh, all be rest assured that uh, the 100 billion target is just not, being, is not going to be fulfilled. It's been pushed to 2023. Then again, on that context itself, the COP26 has failed to deliver. So that's my context on it. Can I just quickly come back on the, because I think this has been a, a big uh, learning experience for the whole world. And uh, the whole uh, concept of health mm -hmm. has, been, has been challenged. You know, when we talk about health or when you talk about health in the UK, you know, you talk about the NHS, the national health system. Um, and I think we have focused too much, we meaning the whole world, on medicinal health. You know, we have looked at how many hospitals, we have looked at how many nurses, we have looked at how many doctors we have got trained, we have looked at how many ventilators we have in our system. Mm -hmm. So that is medicinal health focused on an individual patient. Mm -hmm. But what COVID has actually taught us is that we have also to keep in mind public health, um, because that is the whole issue of you know, uh, clean air, uh, safe drinking water. And uh, the way now relating it to climate change, you know, the new science of zoonosis where viruses are jumping from the animal world onto our terrain, uh, there is nothing to say that we will not have COVID-22. I hope we won't. But, you know, this is how it is now going because at the end of the day, deforestation, uh, habitat loss, mm -hmm. you know, all of these, uh, we are coming, uh, we are interfacing uh, with animals that we should not be interfacing with. We should respect their territories, their boundaries, their habitats. Mm -hmm. And unless you're able to control that, then your public health is going to come under pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, a greater realization of the imperatives of public health and their communication is so very important. You know, you look at how COVID and how the countries responded uh, in America for want of a better example, because the leadership was not accepting it. So it's caused a whole divide. Mm -hmm. And whether you wear a mask or not, actually shows what your political affiliations are. You know, we have politicized it to that level. So <laughs> messaging, trust, getting the people involved, uh, getting them to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, public health is now, it has to be uh, the new area of focus for governments all over the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a quick final question to each of you before I open up this uh, to the floor. I, I guess going back to Nahim first, in your previous answers, you mentioned a lot about the significance of delivery. What roles can young people play in holding you and your administration, your government accountable in terms of keeping on track with delivery? Right, I think uh, it's been rightly put across the question because um, in my context, I think the young people are not corrupt. When I say corrupt, 
That means the corrupt in terms of their goals. They're very spot on. They want to know and they want to see delivery happen. So in that context, I think the young people should be the one who should lead uh, the next phase of development. When I say next phase of development, we need to challenge. I, I already mentioned, we need to challenge institutions to deliver. When I talk about a democratic system, when I talk about multilateralism, the multilateralism is based on governments. The governments are elected by the people. And as such, for Bangladesh itself, 60% of the population is under the age of 35. If you see the numbers, the aspirations of these young people, it is their vote, their voices that needs to ripple effect, that needs to have uh, a delivery to the, any, any government that comes across. It doesn't matter what party is in power. It is the young people who needs to deliver. So when I say these people needs to have mentorship, again, coming back to uh, the aspect of adaptation and mitigation, when I say these things, uh, of course, one of those things is to strengthen institution, allow youth-led organizations for their capacity building. That is something we need to look into because you need to give us the floor to speak, to work, and that's where I think change needs to happen. We should not be inclined to only the words and the text and the commas and the full stops. Rather, the simplicity of the message needs to go through. So hence, the youth, especially for Bangladesh, I think very, very uh, robust, very intelligent, innovative uh, young population that we have. And they are doing so much work uh, already on, on the ground. And more so, they are not waiting for anyone. They're not waiting for me or my colleague or yourself or anyone else. They're making change happen. I work with uh, our organization called Young Bangla. Um, of course, a lot of people in Bangladesh, they know about it. We started this journey in 2014. I'm just gonna take two minutes to just wrap it up. We started this journey in 2014 and the whole idea was to give young people a floor to discuss, to have a discussion and to make their voices be heard. And of course, our job was to facilitate them, to take their voices, take their demands up to the government and the institutions. And I work with about 260-odd youth-led youth organizations, about 160,000 volunteers. Now, they are making grounds happen. They're making things happen. And hence, finally, the word again comes in, we need to challenge the institutions to make things happen. Criticism definitely is a way forward. We need to take criticism positively. We need to make our government, when I say our, because we vote. I am a member of parliament, but then again, I still vote, right? So I vote not only in the national election, but also within the parliament. There are laws, the legislative you know, amendments that are, that are coming through, even to the extent that the speaker is being voted. The president is, the, is voted through us. So we have a right to speak. And since I am still relatively young, let's put it, uh, I would like to challenge you know, the global, when we talk about global citizenship, we talk about global consensus. Of course, the global youth also needs to deliver. And that's where I think this sort of session gives us the platform to speak and also deliver. So empowerment is something that we need to do. We are doing as such. And hopefully I think uh, there, there needs to be uh, a consensus, definitely. But then again, there needs to be aspiration. We need to be hopeful because life goes on. If we do not have any uh, dream and aspiration, we really cannot live a life. So the youth have a lot of uh, aspiration, a lot of dreams. I think that needs to uh, be uh, adopted by governments mm -hmm. and globally have to have consensus. Thank you. So optimistic blueprint for the future. And my final question going to Sabir is, as someone who spent time in Glasgow at this year's conference, one of the key outcome is India's net zero promise. India as Bangladesh ally as a neighbor, also the third largest emitter in the world, have pledged to uh, go carbon neutral by 2070. 
which missed the key target that we set out in 2050. How do you make sense of this disconnect? Um, I'm not sure it's a disconnect. You know, I think India is looking at it strictly from its own uh, perspectives. Um, but what is interesting is if you actually break that down, mm -hmm. uh, which I tried to do. So for 2020 to, or sorry, from now to 2030, there is actually a lot of progress. So I think we all look at it in terms of what it is going to be like in 2070. Mm -hmm. So India is 2070, China is 2060, uh, European Union and the others are on 2050, which is why the text, at least the one that we signed off on yesterday, actually talks about net zero by around middle of the century. So we are not talking about net zero by 2050 in the COP document, it's going to be that. Um, I think there is room for improvement. Uh, hopefully that is a very low base that India started from. But what is important is they've made a commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, this commitment for uh, net zero was not there. Mm -hmm. So now, yes, the commitment is there, but the time frame I think, can and should be more ambitious. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we need to work on. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, I also had a meeting with uh, Xi Zhenhua. Uh, he's the envoy from China. And um, he is, of course, very supportive of, of the developing countries. So I had a very interesting meeting with him in, in Glasgow. Um, so I think China is, is committed. And of course, when China makes a pledge, um, they do follow through. And uh, because of the way their, their system and their economy and their planning is structured, you know, what gets decided at the center filters down to the lower levels very quickly. So we are hoping, you know, I think um, India is, uh, is an aspiring uh, nation. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, they are a global citizen uh, along with the others. And our expectation is that they will revisit that and they will revise their NDCs. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Now I wanna open up uh, the conversation to the floor, give you an opportunity to engage. If you've got a question, please put your hand up. Um, and one of our committee member will get a microphone to you. Uh, I see a hand there, yeah. Yeah, you, if you wait for the microphone and speak up. Greetings, esteemed panelists. I am Nazmus, I'm from Bangladesh. So it can't be denied that the government of Bangladesh and, and the Bangladeshi society has a whole, uh, as a whole has progressed extensively well since 2009, since the Amali government came in power. So I'd like to ask is uh, how does the government of Bangladesh attempt to address the economic effects of the uh, of the vulnerable communities uh, which have arisen due to climate change and this economic effects uh, usually further are extensive to um, future well-being effects uh, psychological well-being effects so we would like to ask um, a question that how does the government try to address the economic effects due to climate change, which are strictly uh, affected upon the vulnerable communities. Thank you. I'd like to express my question to Honorable Saber Hussain Sojuri. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. And um, you know that is something that we as parliamentarians also think about. Because when the budget is approved, um, you know, of course, we are hoping that uh, the budget this year or the last year's budget was going to focus on a green, um, on a green budget. But because of COVID, COVID took preference. Um, the first thing I think is we have identified well who the vulnerable people are. You know, you must do that. So I think that marking has been done properly. And we have this whole system of social safety net that our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has devised. It is being uh, expanded all the time. Uh, and especially during COVID, you know, that was also the case. So in addition to the support for businesses, for industries, we also try to identify who are the most vulnerable. And uh, as you are from Bangladesh, you will also appreciate that uh, the uh, employment in the informal sector is very high. Um, so how do we actually get to those people? This is always a challenge. Uh, so the databases are there because we have through the voter card system and all of the data now being collected. So we know who they are. We have special programs for the coastal areas because this is the, these are the people who are the most vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, so for displacement, there's actually a very interesting project that we are now looking at. It's already, we have piloted that. So when these people are displaced and they come to, let's say, Dhaka City, so we need to find them jobs. Uh, we need to train them. 
because it's one is saving lives, the other is enriching the livelihood prospects of the lives that we have saved. So that, I think, is going to be a very successful project. So we are trying to train them. So a lot of them have gone to, for instance, in Ghazipur. So we are looking at what are the skills that the Ghazipur area needs. And then we train them in that so that they are displaced, but they don't become a burden on the host community. And again, being absolutely frank, you know, Bangladesh is sheltering almost 1.3 million Rohingyas from Myanmar. We have not touched upon that. So a lot of works are being done for that. But we see that there is a tension with the host community because the local people are saying, what is being done for us? You know, these people have come in. And, and so this is an area that we need to address. Uh, so I think we, we have done that quite well. And just for your reference, last year, because I know people want to have figures and statistics, we spent close to $3 billion. It's actually $2.96 billion was allocated to adapt to climate change. So that is, of course, climate proofing your infrastructure. So, you know, this whole idea of resilience, uh, because climate change is a moving goalpost, so you spend a little bit more when you build a road uh, so that the road doesn't get washed away. And, and the idea of resilience is that you absorb the shock of the initial impact and then you recover from it. So bouncing back is also a very important part of resilience. And then you go to a higher level because the shock is also going to come in the future, probably at a greater intensity. So um, I think for our prime minister also, and that helps, you know, we as parliamentarians work, but when we have that overall leadership from the top, her focus is actually the, the people who are the most marginalized. Even when we are fixing the budget and we are trying to see how the allocation is going to go, you know, she actually sits down, uh, she does a table of what are the essential commodities a family needs to buy to survive on a daily basis. And she makes sure that the prices of those essential commodities are actually controlled. So this is our number one focus, and it has to be even more so in the future. Thank you for the question. Is there anything you wish to add, Nahim? Uh, of course, it means what uh, my colleague has already mentioned, it elaborates everything else. But then again, I just want to put a note on it as well, that our Honorable Prime Minister has initiated two major uh, master plan. We call it master plan, as in foresight going forward. One is Muji Prosperity, Climate Prosperity Plan. So this is a detailed, you know, climate resilient plan in motion. And of course, since we are a Delta, hence the other project that she's taken up, which is a Delta plan, as in how do we keep our rivers and canals and everything else open, at the same time create uh, the ecosystem which will not have diverse adverse effect, yeah, and hence. So these two, uh, Mujib Prosperity, Climate Prosperity Plan and Delta Plan, these two are very important master plans that is in motion right now. So we are hopeful that next year it will come in act, I think, maybe. Uh, you have already, through the ministry, I think they've already approved the draft. So next year it will come into action. So we are taking adequate measures, which of course uh, addresses the climate migrants or climate change in different areas, mapping and everything else to go with it. So it's a very, very detailed plan. So uh, if anyone is uh, interested, they just can download the draft. You will see it's a very, very detailed plan. So we are taking into account every aspect of climate change. Thank you. <laughs> so we have another question. Um, perhaps ask the member here. Yeah, sorry for that. So I wonder, so you have just mentioned that, so now we are working towards the 2050 net zero um, commitment. I wonder, so um, do you think it is very promising or do you think maybe we need to take some, uh, a little bit longer than that to um, reach the net zero com commitment? Um, as I mentioned, you know, based on the pledges we have as of now, and assuming that those pledges are on at 100%, which is a big assumption, because you know whatever you pledge, you don't keep. But if those pledges were honored 100%, we are at uh, 2.4 uh, as an average. But remember, I don't know whether there's anyone from Africa here, but 2.4 as an average means that if you are near the equator, if you're in Africa, you're looking at 3.5 to 4 degrees Celsius rise in temperatures. 
So as I said, this is uh, anything above two is going to simply destroy your coral reefs all over the world. So the ecosystem hit is going to be massive. That is why, you know, the concern, that is why the urgency, that is why everyone was saying this is going to be the make or break COP because the time is running out. And as I said, if you act next year or the year after, it might indeed be too little too late. Hmm. That's great. I'll take a final question. Uh, the member there on the front bench. Yeah. Uh, thank you um, to give me a chance to make a question to one of our pa panelists. So Balance, as you know, is a country of uh, rivers. And also we are the most vulnerable countries in the world for the uh, climate change. I hope this COP26 will be successful. At the end, we'll have reached to consensus. But if not, and in that case, uh, what the policy uh, should take countries like us or do you think we should make some kind of um, collaboration with those countries that is same, uh, facing the same kind of problem? So we raise voices to give a pressure to make the next one be more successful. Thank you. Right. I'll go first. I think uh, you know, we have to be very optimistic, let's put it, right? But uh, we're not waiting for anyone. Bangladesh was one of the first who actually got the climate change fund with their own money, and we have acted. So we're not waiting for anyone. But of course, you know, we have to be optimistic. It's a global community that we're talking about. So we are doing as much as we can. Uh, hence, we will continue to do so, and very aggressively, hence, do so. Uh, but then again, you know, there is uh, a limit uh, to how much we can do at what rate that we do. As Mr. Sabir and Chaudhry has mentioned, you know, the time is now, it's not tomorrow really, to be honest. We need to act now. Tomorrow is maybe just too late. The glaciers are melting as he's mentioned. And uh, as such, people need to go on the ground and see what is the impact. It's just, uh, it's, the impacts are massive. And the ecosystem is, ecosystem is being affected. And it's not only in Bangladesh we're talking about, the United States, Brazil, we have had huge wildfire. Australia, huge blood, uh, uh, wildfires. The Europe has, has never actually, in the last couple of decades, hasn't actually experienced any, anything like the floods that has been actually seen in the last, uh, uh, last year, I think it was last year. So it's affecting everyone. So I think it's uh, COVID on top of COVID. I think these changes in terms of climate uh, it, it's, it's a wake-up sign, and we just need to act. And tomorrow, let's let's be hopeful. And if not tomorrow, we continue the dialogue, but we act in our own accord, and we continue our efforts in tackling climate change. Mm -hmm. That's great. I allow one final question from our partner from the Oxford Bangladesh Society. Um, I just want to uh, take this opportunity to register a protest uh, on behalf of Youth Policy Forum Climate Change Advocacy. I know that Bangladesh has done a lot of work uh, on cutting down on coal-based power plants, but many young people that I work with are genuinely concerned about one particular power plant called Rampar Power Plant, uh, which is um, uh, which, which the government is planning to do uh, near Shundarbans. Shundarbans is the forest that saves Bangladesh from all uh, disaster and natural calamities. So through the two esteemed um, Member of Parliaments, I want to like you know advocate and register the youth voice uh, as uh, Mr. The uh, Member of Parliament asked us to challenge. So we want to say that uh, as young people, we don't want Rampal to go ahead. We want Bangladesh to be the leading advocate, uh, for, like of CVF, and we think that Bangladesh should reconsider its position on Rampal power plant. Thank you so much. Right. Um, I just want to answer the question itself. Um, if you look into the details of Rampal, now the mangrove, the, the, which is the Sundarbans, uh, UNESCO has outlined the area which has to be protected, which is about 14 kilometers radius. And Rampal is uh, not in the zone, it's outside the zone. And when we talk about the technology, the technology is ultra super critical, okay? So, you would not see uh, the chimneys from the chimneys, what we 
you know, perceive that, imagine the black smokes coming out of it. No, it is ultra supercritical, which is a technology which is far more advanced. I think in the world, I think about seven to eight countries are the only ones who are doing it. So this is a way advanced technology. So the Minister of uh, Power and Energy, we were in one of those uh, functions a couple of days back, and he welcomed anyone and everyone to visit Rampal and see what actually is being done. It is a lot of uh, information gap that exists. Uh, I'm not saying that you know it's good for the country. Anything to do with coal is not good. But then again, the information needs to be available and you need to come and visit and see what the reality is. There's a lot of misinformation which is, uh, uh, which is across the board. So this is something I, um, he's made it very open. I think uh, anyone who, is, who wishes to come and visit, they're open to coming and visiting because seeing is believing. And that's where I think we need to make it very clear that although we are shutting down and we have shut down coal power plants, Rampal, on the other hand, uh, of course we need to generate power, no doubt. And of course, Bangladesh being the largest solar uh, application, household solar application in the world, 5.8 million households. And we are going more towards green. The government of Ministry of Power and Energy has targeted 20, by 2030 to do 40%, 40% of the power mix to be on renewable energies. Right now, it, we are hovering around 5%. But this is a very aggressive uh, approach that Bangladesh has taken up. So uh, as a part of the whole uh, discussion, I welcome anyone, and of course, I'm willing to uh, facilitate any visit to clarify uh, the position regarding Rampa. Thank you. I just uh, answered my, I think it's a, it's a very important question and I've also been asked, uh, especially the young people, and it is absolutely right that they should ask. You know, I think uh, um, we should not be defensive about it. If somebody wants to know, we should be as transparent and as open because there might be things that we will also learn in the process. So I'm always positive with those things. One of the, um, the skills that we are trying to acquire is uh, those who are involved with environment, you will be familiar with this. It's called a strategic um, environment analysis, okay? So to give you an example, you know, we have a lot of uh, brick manufacturing plants in Bangladesh. So when someone applies for an approval, we look at what is the pollution from that one particular chimney. But when you have a cluster of those in an area, then there is the collective emission that has to be considered. And this will probably be greater than you know, the one single. So also for the Sundarbans, uh, the UNESCO has asked us to do a strategic environmental analysis assessment that we are doing. We have actually hired consultants. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, let the process go through. Uh, there'll be nothing to hide. And UNESCO is you know, a very respected organization. Uh, they have given us the guidelines. And we from the um, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Ministry of Environment, we are actually watching that process very closely. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, national interest is national interest. And uh, now with the, um, the stewardship and the leadership that Bangladesh is showing when it comes to the environment, we will certainly not take any steps or actions that is going to dilute that position. Thank you, Sabir. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I think today we had a lot of really insightful takeaway on, on climate change. Please do join me uh, to thank Nahim and Sabir for their time to join us to have this conversation today. Thank you. <laughs>